Welcome to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Education. I'm Pete Wright, and today on the show, we're talking about what it means to be a beginner. Peter Denning is a distinguished professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Peter joins Howard today in a conversation about what it is to be a beginner and the power of facing our moods of discomfort and confusion that mark being a beginner. He shares with us his own journey, along with his learning about mood and how to move in the world from his learning with Dr. Fernando Flores and Gloria Flores. The conversation runs about a half hour, and along the way you'll hear Peter's Beginner's Creed, a reminder to embrace our own moods as we navigate learning anything new. And now, Howard Teibel and Peter Denning. Peter, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. So you and I were together around a year ago, and I mentioned to you how moved I was about this creed you wrote about what it is to be a beginner. And in an article that you wrote with Gloria Flores, the title or the subtitle is, We All Need to Learn to Be Expert Beginners. What were the seeds for you that allowed this creed to emerge? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a practicing professor, so I profess a lot. And I was, uh, it was, uh, I think, August of 2016, I was teaching my class on computer operating systems. And uh, we gave out the first quiz. And I knew when I graded the quiz that when I handed back the quiz, they were going to be unhappy with their grades. Because they just, uh, you know, they all want to do well, but uh, they're just not they weren't doing well, okay? Uh, wasn't bad, but I knew they were going to be unhappy. And so I asked uh, during one of my meditation sessions for an inspiration on what I could say to them because I thought they were going to be in a bad mood. What could I say to them that would transform their mood so they could actually learn from the results of the test? Uh, and an inspiration came to me, which... Uh, was basically what you see, the uh, Beginner's Creed, and I just wrote it down in about an hour. And was that was just in time to take it to class with me. And I took it to class. And when I got to, to the class, they were all, we handed back their papers, and they were all looking very dejected. Nobody had any right. eye contact. They were all looking down at their tabletops. No one even looking at each other. So I said uh, to them, uh, I said, how many of you, feel like you're an expert at something. Now, these are all 30 to 35-year-old graduate students, so everybody raised their hand because they actually are an expert at something. So we have 30 students in that room, 30 hands up saying, I'm an expert at something. Then I asked, uh, how many of you feel like you're a beginner in this course on operating systems? And 30 hands went up. Then I asked, how many of you like being a beginner? Two hands went up. Right. They said, there's what we need to talk about. Uh, so that's, I said, I'm going to read you a meditation I put together on what it means to be a beginner. Because you all said you feel like beginners. So let's talk about that. And I'm going to read you this. And then when I read you this, I'd like you to take it and put it in the front of your notebook and read it to yourself every day for a week. And then after that, whenever you feel like you're getting stuck because you're an expert, being thrust into a beginner situation that you don't like. Take this out and read it and see if it gets you back into the play. And so that's what we did. The, the, uh, I read it to them. The, the mood in the room changed. The eye contact came back, and we had a great remaining hour in that class. But after that, a lot of people became interested in this meditation, and so we, uh, we published it, and I got a lot of fan mail on it. Uh, a lot of people have found it to be very good for helping their students uh, enter into a mood where they can actually learn and not stumble over their own expertise in another area. You know, what do you do when you find yourself thrown into a new game and expected to somehow perform there and you don't know a darn thing about it? And it's real easy to see how somebody falls into a bad mood over that. Like, this is impossible. I can't get it done. I don't know why I'm here. And uh, any possibility of learning gets shut down when you're in that mood. I mean, to me, that that is what I think you're pointing to, is that in that moment of receiving an opinion or an assessment from somebody or from you know, a, a, a test result, 
you what you stop doing is you stop exploring, right? It, th- to me, that is what I think is is profound about your recognition in that moment that by getting in our bodies, and I assume that's that's why you ask them to read it. It's almost like a meditative practice. Exactly right. You know, the mood, as we know, moods are dispositions that kind of take you over. You you don't ask for them. They're just there. But you can change them and you can cultivate them. You and I found ourselves together uh, in a program with Dr. Fernando Flores. And that's where I began the discovery, even even before discovering uh, the Beginner's Creed, this whole disposition around mood. And then subsequently reading the book Learning to Learn, which Gloria Flores wrote. I'm curious about in the work you've done over the years with Dr. Fernando Flores, what are some of the things that helped inform this area for you that that emerged around uh, creating a beginner's creed and and even the whole area of mood? Well, you know, I've been studying with Fernando for I don't know thirty five years or something like that. Been a long time, and um, I've always found it very fertile to talk to him because he opens up new possibilities for for how we can move around in the world using our conversations that we're always engaged in. And uh, this this had was like a very large opening for me a long time ago to discover that I had this enormous power in the world because I could do simple things like I could make a request, I could make a promise, I could make an offer, I could make a declaration, I can make an assessment. And uh, nobody can stop me from doing any of those things. All I need to do is take responsibility for my requests, promises, offers, declarations, and assessments. And I can move the world. Like not necessarily the whole world, but at least the piece of the world I'm in. And people have to respond to those things. And I don't think that most people normally think like that. And I was very grateful from... Uh, being with Fernando and all of his uh, colleagues to have this open up for me because I came from a background as an engineer where everything is information oriented. The whole idea that by speaking I can move the world had never occurred to me. That, that idea, uh, I, I love the simplicity of how you lay that out uh, because on the surface, it seems almost obvious. Yeah, making a request, but there's something deeper about embodying that as a as a as an act where it's not about the words, it's about the what possibilities you open up and how you can literally shift the universe that you're in through understanding how to use them. And I'm I'm still exploring that myself and and exploring this with some of our um some of our colleagues. That's part of the background I bring along with me is that I keep telling my students, if you come to this understanding about how we use our language, you'll discover you have an enormous power to be a leader that you never suspected you had. Right. right. And nobody can take it away from you. Because nobody can prevent you from making a request. Nobody can prevent you from making an offer. Okay, you have total freedom to do those things. Obviously, you need to take responsibility, and if there's consequences, you have to deal with them. But nobody can stop you. Well, what's fascinating about the those those different speech acts is the one that's most obvious to people when I talk about it, because everybody would, I think, on the surface say, "Yeah, I I, I make requests all the time," but when you talk about one of them declining, you know, so asking somebody to be comfortable in their body to make saying no or declining a request you can see when you do this you, the difficulty people have so that to me is an example of why practicing these things are so important and the more you get into it, you the more you realize that even the ones that seem obvious like making a request uh, is not something that we do comfortably and then in the the nature of working together, that's the foundation for being able to make things happen in our lives. And the fact that it's strongly tied up with your body, because we we embody these things. So 
not when I make a request, I have emotional reactions. And I have to deal with those emotional reactions. And those emotional reactions are based in my own past history. And not only that, my own past history, a lot of them are based in the history of my community, my family, my my company, and everything else. Because I pick up all these little pieces from everywhere. And all of those things mix together and give me a reaction at the moment I'm making my request. So I might might be fearful about making a request because I don't want a certain consequence to come to me. And I therefore hold back and don't make the request. Now nothing happens because I didn't make the request. So if I'm going to become more effective, I need to recognize my mood of being fearful and see if I can break that mood and get out of it so that I can then be effective in making my requests. The same thing is true about making offers and promises and everything else. Okay. So I want to come back to the this the domain of moods around being a beginner because you talked about earlier when you ask thirty people how many of you want to be uh, are, are comfortable being a beginner, uh, two people raise their hands and I have been taking your um, your beginner's creed and and in leading different events for different groups. We read this together. We read out this out loud to each other. And I'll start by asking how many of you uh, or, or where in your life are you a beginner? And what's fascinating when I ask this of adults who are in the work, workforce, they'll describe things like skiing or they'll describe things like uh, learning to cook. And invariably, they rarely acknowledge an area where they're a beginner at work. And I find that so interesting. And and I think we don't even realize how that affects our capacity to lead a team and what kind of permission we give the people that work for us. So if we're not comfortable being a beginner and, our, and the people that report to us aren't, this is one of the reasons why we are making mistakes, but we're not revealing them. Because I think we have this sense as an adult that we have to live up to this resume that we were brought in here and we're supposed to have minimally competency or proficiency in everything we do, which is a fallacy. Well, one of the things I found out when I talked to my students about this is that the, when you're an expert, you actually like being an expert. So it's more than just, uh, I don't know, feeling like, You've accumulated a lot of uh, expertise over the years. You've become good at something, but you actually like it. You mean it feels good in your body? Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah, it feels yeah. good. I like being an expert. I like people looking right. up to me. I like people uh, asking me questions where my expertise comes out and I'm able to help them. Uh, and I don't like it when I'm not an expert anymore. So if you put me into a, someplace where I need to learn something new, I'm almost by definition not going to be the expert. And so what do I do? I, I shut down in some way. I might uh, not want to learn and start complaining a lot. Or I might try and inject my expertise in the other domain into the new one and offend people because they say, well, what does this have to do with anything with us? You know, <laughs> I don't care if you're an expert skier because in this company, we're not trying to ski. Right, right. The beginning of this article you write, why is it when we need to learn something new that will benefit our work and home life, we often find ourselves blocked by invisible forces? When learning fails, we miss out on important projects, promotions, and opportunities. We end up suffering and falling short of our objectives. Somehow, for many of us, our natural capacity to learn seems to deteriorate over time, especially in areas where we care about the most. I think that the, that speaks to sort of the background that seems to show up for all of us. At the same time, those of us, those of us who have uh, an awareness and, and a love of learning, uh, it seems to me they have a capacity to navigate this in a different way. There's a bigger conversation here than just learning. And one of the domains that I have exposed myself to, actually got exposed to uh, through Fernando Flores, is the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, where it starts with 
being a novice or a beginner, and it goes through these six levels up to being a master. I mean, I didn't even know there was an idea called an advanced beginner, but you know, to go from there to competency, proficiency, expertise, and mastery. So how does your reflection as a professor in learning, how does that relate back to these, uh, th- this developing skills uh, from being a beginner through mastery? Well, let's, let's go back to that operating system class. This is a class of, you know, per- fairly complex, well-matured technology. There's a lot of technical details in there that if somebody wants to actually be a programmer of an operating system or a administrator of an operating system, they need to know this immense amount of detail and it takes a long time to learn it. So this, this is an old uh, profession, you want to call it that. Um, so I've always approached it with my students like you are – entering into this professional domain called operating systems. There's a lot of experts out there already. You're brand new. You don't know a darn thing about this. And you have to learn how to move in this domain. And learning how to move, the first step in this is to acknowledge that you're brand new. You're a new recruit. You've never been here before. You don't even know what the heck is going on. And Say, you know, declare yourself that I'm here, I'm brand new, I want to learn. But learning is more than uh, what you might call mental knowledge. Learning is the ability to move skillfully and do things in that domain that the other people would make an assessment that you know what you're doing. Okay, so when you do appear to know what you're doing and you can do the kind of what they consider the everyday standard type of interactions with customers and all these things, uh, the everyday standard type of tasks, that you, and you can do them without supervision, you can do them without making mistakes, and you have the good sense to know when you need to ask for help, that's when they say you're competent, because they can count on you, and you're not going to cause a breakdown for them. And somewhere in between being the beginner who knows nothing and the competent person who can perform standard actions without creating breakdowns is this intermediate stage we call the advanced beginner. And here uh, you become familiar enough with the domain. You know the terminology. You know the basic rules. You can perform basic moves. You feel hesitant a lot still because you're not sure whether the moves are right Uh, You you don't find things that other people seem to know at your fingertips. You have to scrounge around and remember them. Uh, So so this is the the stage of the advanced beginner. Uh, You often need somebody who's more advanced than you to kind of keep an eye on you. So if you do make a mistake, which you're likely to do, you can recover from it pretty quickly. We're talking about an ability to move here. And the learning, the learning is the acquisition of the skill that lets you move in the domain. Is an area in your life, you know, and, and I think this is an interesting question because I consider you to be an expert in so many domains. Uh, and if you look at your background, that's the case. And uh-huh. I know you've got, uh, you've written, and we'll talk about this in maybe our next podcast, The Expert's Lament, which is a different kind of, of uh exploration of what it is to be an expert. But what would be an example for you of moving to advanced beginner? Uh, can you just give an example to our listeners? I think we all understand what it is to be, be a beginner in the sense that we know that it is a domain that we have no experience and that we have no capacity to move and that we have to rely on somebody else and follow instructions. C- can you give an example in your life even where you f- you have found yourself to be an advanced beginner? I, I uh, actually did something like that about two years ago, I think. I was cleaning out my shelves, and I found <laughs> an old Rubik's Cube. And I used to be good at solving the Rubik's Cube, but I took this thing out. It was like a complete strange object to me. I had no idea how to solve the Rubik's Cube. And I even found one of my cheat seats, sheets that I had written. that had mathematical formulas written on it to remind me how to move the cube and solve it. And I couldn't decipher the formulas. It was like, you know, you know, I said, I am a beginner. 
even though I once knew this thing, I am a beginner. I can't remember a thing about what, what this, how to solve this cube. So I started doing things like exploring on the web, trying to get, uh, you know, guidebooks on how do you solve a Rubik's cube. And there's loads and loads of different ways to solve it out there. And I finally decided what I needed to do was just start practicing. So I picked one of the guidebooks and just started doing what they said. And at first I was, you know, the first day or two, I was stumbling all over the place and making mistakes everywhere. Couldn't follow the guidebook, couldn't even understand the notation and couldn't get the cube into the configuration they said it should go into. So this, this, persisted for about two days of just doing this. Uh, maybe I was doing it 20 minutes a day like this. And all of a sudden it started to become familiar. And I was able to get maybe to the first couple of steps in the guidebook. Uh, and so I kept at it. And after about seven days, I could solve the cube without looking at the guidebook anymore in about three minutes, which is what they said, you know, a minimally competent person should be able to do. The experts at solving the cube could do it in 15 seconds or something. So I, I don't know how they do that, but that's what they were doing. But but I love that you were turned back to something that you were an ex, you you were competent in. You got away from it, and now you found yourself back in a space where you knew that you could learn it. You that you didn't just purely have to follow instructions. That you knew you at one point had the competency, and that what you're characterizing, it, but you weren't competent anymore. So that's the space between being a beginner and being competent is reflecting back on that. You know, being right in that middle place. But it was being it was being willing to wait until my body was able to perform the moves. Yeah, I couldn't perform the moves. They, yeah. you know, the guidebook said, "Here's the move. You know, twist this way, twist that way." And I couldn't couldn't even get myself to do that the way they said. And it took a few days of just doing it before that kind of clicked in, and I started saying, "Oh, now I see what they're talking about." So there's a like a process of embodiment that goes on here, where I started out with no embodiment, and then the moves started to get embodied, and I was able to call upon them without having to think about that. I love it. What a great lesson. What a great example. That is advanced beginnerhood. I still needed the guidebook to keep going, but at least I started to kind of feel like I'm getting somewhere. I'm, I see what these guys are talking about. I'm going to read the Beginner's Creed, and we're going to make it available, and I'm going to encourage people to be reading along with me. But I'm going to read it now. And, and anyone listening still, I would really encourage you to just have this up and to see what emerges. You know, one of the fascinating things I have discovered in my studying with Fernando Flores is the idea that I've never read this before. You know, that I could I could have a mood, oh, I've read this before. And I have read this like probably 50 times. But the truth is every time I read it, I know something else shows up. So here's my invitation to you, Peter. I'm gonna read this out loud and I'd love to then ask you after I read it, what emerging for you that might be new, that just showed up in hearing it again fresh, uh, and see if there's something that is still there and, and that that can produce a certain sort of a, a new awareness that maybe you didn't have before. Is that? Can we try this? Sure, we can try it. All right, let's see what happens. The Beginner's Creed. I am a beginner. I am entering a new game about which I know nothing. I do not yet know how to move in this game. I see many other people playing in this game now. This game has gone on for many years prior to my arrival. I am a new recruit arriving here for the first time. I see value to me in learning to navigate in this domain. There is much for me to learn the basic terminology, the basic rules, the basic moves of action, the basic strategies. While I am learning these things, I may feel various negative reactions, overwhelmed at how much there is to learn, insecure that I do not know what to do, inadequate that I lack the capacity to do this, frustrated and discouraged that my progress is so slow, Angry that I've been given insufficient guidance. 
anxious that I will never perform up to expectations on which my career depends. Embarrassed that everyone can see my mistakes. But these moods are part of being a beginner. It does not serve my goal and ambition to dwell in them. Instead, if I make a mistake, I will ask what lesson does this teach? If I make a discovery, I will celebrate my aha moment. If I feel alone, I will remember that I have many friends ready to help. If I am stuck, I will ask for help from my teachers. Over time, I will make fewer mistakes. I will gain confidence in my abilities. I will need less guidance from my teachers and friends. I will gain familiarity with the game. I will be able to have intelligent conversations with others in the game. I will not cause breakdowns for promises that I lack the competence to keep. I have an ambition to become competent, perhaps even proficient or expert in this game. But for now, I am a beginner. Bravo. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm. I'm reading this in front of the author, and I'm. I'm. I'm feeling my nervousness as I'm reading this. Like, I, I got to get this right. <laughs> that was great. I. I love reading it, Peter. So, so let me ask you. Mm-hmm. Um, did anything show up for you new in hearing it again? Uh, well, this this is the uh, first time uh, somebody has actually read it to me. Is that right? Yeah. In your lifetime? Yeah. Okay. And I, so I see in the way you're reading and the way you're reacting that you are progressing through the different moods as you're reading them. Yes. Uh, and so that was one of the points here is that I could speak about the moods that you could re- you could have as a beginner and have them kind of pop up for you while you're reading it. The one that... Uh, I think is like a turning point for people is the one where it says, I, I, I am angry that I have been given insufficient guidance. Yes. Okay. So it's, it's, it goes beyond being overwhelmed, insecure, inadequate, and frustrated. I'm angry. That's like a turning point to realize that I'm angry. That's, that's fascinating to see. Yeah. There's something in that, in that mood uh, you know, it's one thing to be overwhelmed, privately insecure, feeling inadequate. The shift for me in that statement is that uh, it's the first time there's a pointing outward, right? Be, being given insufficient guidance by others, right? right? That I'm in the world with others and and I sort of had an expectation that I should be in a different place and other people should have given me guidance. Almost like, I mean, the worst case scenario in that for people is when they fall into being a victim. I agree with you there. That's There's like a turning point in that list of negative moods. Insecurity, overwhelmed, inadequate, frustrated are all things you can keep to yourself. But angry, you can't keep to yourself. Yes. Anxious, where everybody sees that you're anxious and embarrassed. <laughs> That also resonates with a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. I, I get embarrassed. So I have just a again. This is more of a personal curiosity. How many edits did you have in this one? I mean, or did this come out like uh, Let It Be when it, you had a first take and it was done? I told you that I had an inspiration that came to me in a meditation. You know, I asked for an inspiration and it came. And I just said I, I'm going to go write it down, and it took me about. 20, 30 minutes to write it down. And that was pretty much Yeah, it. this came from somewhere you couldn't even, you, you couldn't have orchestrated this uh, in your intellect. It just came to you. Well, I'm sure, uh, you know, Fernando would say that it, it, it arose out of all the learning and all the conversations I've been in the, yes. in the past. And he would, he would probably say he likes this because it shows that I have a different side besides the professor who wants to tell everybody right. stuff. Very good. I can actually speak in language that relates to their feelings and their emotions and their concerns and awakens yes. in them uh, the possibility they can move in a different direction. 
that's definitely not the language of a professor who stands in front of a room and lectures. No, no, that came from someplace else. You can say it came from many years of thinking about these things, and finally I'm open up enough where I could say them. Or maybe it was just, uh, you know, an inspiration from the universe that came and hit me at the right time and the right place, and here we are. Well, I have to tell you, I- I'm deeply grateful uh, one, to have met you, and two, to have this creed in my life. It has, it is not only serving me as I read it, but it is serving the people that uh, I find myself around. So you, you have, you have done a, a beautiful service for people to really learn what it is to embody being a beginner. And I, I hope to continue. Uh, this dialogue with you because I think there's so much more we can talk about and just thank you so much for being willing to be on the show and I know that this is something that I'm going to really promote strongly for folks because I think this is a this is a missing piece in our world and for us as adults and I know that that the pluralistic network and the work that they're doing really uh, embodies this work so I Thank you so much. Bottom line, thank you so much for being willing to uh, share this with us. And let's do this again, okay? Okay, you're on. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the show this week. You'll find links to The Beginner's Creed, the article Peter Denning has written on this very subject in the show notes or on our website at tybalink.com. On behalf of Peter Denning and Howard Tybal, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next time right here on Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Education.